We're living through one of the greatest revolutions in history. Even more than the epic events of the French or Russian revolutions, it's changed how we live in Britain. And yet many of us don't even notice it's happening. The revolution I'm talking about is the ongoing transformation in the rights and roles of women. And much of this change has been driven by successive waves of feminism and activism, each redefining what women want. years of Time Watch and 70 years of BBC archive films, we'll plot the revolutionary changes from militancy... To say I enjoyed making fires sounds rather awful, doesn't it? ...to sexual liberation. You just popped it in your mouth, it was, and then you went out boogieing all night. You know, it was just... it was marvellous. By comparing how films from different eras saw the issues of their time, it becomes clear just how far things have changed. So here's a Time Watch guide to women, sex and society. The story of one of the most fundamental changes in British history. Since the beginning of the 20th century, there have been at least three waves of feminism. The first came into focus before World War I, concentrating on getting the vote for women. The second wave swept across the Western world as part of the revolutionary movements of the 1960s, questioning all aspects of life and making the personal political. By the 1990s, a third wave of feminists were teaching women's studies courses amid a wider attempt to broaden the movement to include women of all classes, races and sexualities. This film, Votes for Women, about the suffragette struggle, was made in 1968, just as the second wave of feminists were beginning to hit their stride. By looking back at the first wave of suffragette pioneers, women of the 60s could see just how organized and radical they would have to become. Their claim to vote on equal terms with men was logical and reasonable, and many leading politicians agreed with them. But they wanted the government itself to sponsor a suffrage bill, and the liberals who formed the government were divided on the issue. The suffragettes hoped to force their hand by intervening against them in by-elections. The government were not impressed, and so the fight was on. The film shows how repeatedly failing to get the vote through non-violence meant that the more radical suffragettes turned to terrorism. In July 1912, with the arrest of their leaders, the suffragettes turned to arson. Their plans were carefully laid, and scarcely any of them were caught. Just to say I enjoyed making fires sounds rather awful, doesn't it? But it really was lovely to find that you'd been successful, that the thing really had burned down and you hadn't got caught. And I know we only just got out in time on one occasion. But there we were, there was the thing blazing, and there we were in the glare of the lights. Well, later on, we thought it wasn't a good idea to make the fire straight away so that we could be seen in the light of it. So we got dark lanterns. I believe they were police dark lanterns. We directed a trail of cotton wool soaked in paraffin to this dark lantern, wrapped it round the bottom of the candle. Then we got it all built up and ready, put a sort of shade round in case any light could be seen from any angle from this dark lantern. Then we lit the candle and went away. And when the candle had burnt down to the cotton wool, it presumably, we didn't stop to see, ran along the cotton wool and set fire to it. <clears throat> By then, we were miles away, very likely. Thousands of pounds worth of property went up in flames. Pillar boxes were fired, public buildings gutted. The women took care to avoid risking the lives of people or animals, but as their acts grew more outrageous, they began to lose sympathisers. The idea that we have of the suffragette movement is one of middle-class women who chained themselves to railings. And that is the smallest amount of 
of violent action that the suffragettes were taking part in. It was an intense campaign of civil unrest in the same league as the Irish Republicans, in the same league as the anarchists. It was just as dangerous and it was just as terrifying for the society of the time. These were women committing the same actions as men, but we have completely forgotten this part of history. With the suffragette movement, they are constantly caricatured as women who chain themselves to things. And actually, very few suffragettes did much chaining. A couple chained themselves to the grill in the House of Commons, and a couple chained themselves to the railings at Downing Street. There isn't much else chaining to railings that goes on. And you see exactly the same thing with the women's liberation movement, of course, and bra burning, that bra burning was much more of a metaphor and occasionally took place symbolically on demonstrations, but women's liberation supporters are constantly referred to as bra burners, just as suffragettes are referred to as those silly women that chain themselves to things. It was in a sense for a time parasitic on the How have we developed our image of the suffragettes? Tremendous enthusiasm. Less radical women from the time of the suffragettes reacted to the film Votes for Women on the same night it was broadcast. How extensive was the feeling among women in all classes that they wanted the vote? One gets the impression from the photographs in the film tonight that they were really rather upper class and really well dressed with uh, uh, private means, the sort of families who could support ladies going out to well, protest it, in the it, park. It wasn't only that, you see, it was it, certainly the bulk of the work was done by leisured women. It had to be. It had to be. Uh, the women who afterwards went into social service, went on to committees, you know, went on uh, organize a League of Nations union meetings and all the rest of it. It was, it had of course a strong working class support from, especially in Manchester, but um, it was in, in a way a middle class agitation for that reason that, that it's only middle class women who had the leisure to pursue it. Have we remembered the middle class women who spoke publicly and forgotten the militants? To look at the suffragettes now, it really is a very almost cosy memory. We hold these women up as martyrs, as women who we have huge respect for, but we are really only focusing on a very small part of the movement, and that is the leadership of the Pankhursts, which is middle class, highly educated women who are incredibly eloquent and very persuasive. And of course, the women's movement, the wider women's movement, is so much more than that and, so, and represents so many more women in different worlds than that. The suffragette story is intimately linked to World War I. Some historians, and even some of those involved in the struggle, feel that the Great War did more for women's rights than the suffragettes did. Votes for Women lays out a clear cause and effect between the war and women getting the vote. Within a month of war being declared, the militants abandoned their campaign. No other organisation in Britain could rival theirs for publicity and propaganda, and the government needed their help in the war effort. All those held in prison were released. Women now prosecuted the fight against Germany with all the energy and courage they had displayed in their battle for the vote. In factories, on the land, in auxiliary services, they became a formidable ally of the government they had so recently defied. In February 1918, and without any fuss, the bill became law. At one stroke, six million women were now able to vote for the first time. It was the end of the road. Since Votes for Women was made in 1968, the role of World War I in getting women the vote has been re-evaluated yet again. When the vote comes in, this argument that it's because of the work that women did, many historians, many women's historians get quite concerned about this because what it's almost saying is that 
when the suffragettes were demanding the vote, the government wouldn't listen to them. But then during the war, when they behaved like good, sensible girls and went and worked in factories, they got rewarded. And I think that's a very dangerous analogy, saying that, you know, you've, you've got to be a good girl to get what you want. Sometimes government doesn't give you what you want if you're good. Sometimes you have to actually go out and get it. The women's movement seemed to have gone quiet in the years after World War I. It took 70 years and a third wave of feminism to recognise that women's lives were actually changing in the years after 1918. This 1995 edition of Time Watch uncovered a quiet revolution that transformed both women's work and the home. Revolution, we imagine, is about men, machines, weapons and death. Yet this century, one of the most important revolutions has taken place in the home. In 1900, domestic service was the biggest single occupation. At least one in three women was a domestic servant at some time in her life. Fifty years later, the servants were all but gone and with them an entire way of life that touched us all. At the beginning of the century, servants worked around 80 hours a week, sometimes more if they worked alone. The work they did in the early part of this century had changed little from the 18th century. The film goes to some lengths to point out the attitudes of the time that were no longer acceptable in 1995. Middle-class women were often warned not to become too friendly with their employees. Servants were from a different species. The low status of the work reflected on the people who did it. Uniforms and names were used to suppress individuality. She didn't even want to call me Ivy, she wanted to call me Mary. I said, I don't want to be called Mary, my name is Ivy. She said, well, your name is Elizabeth, isn't it? I said, yes, but I don't, I don't like Elizabeth and I don't like Mary. I said, I like to be called Ivy. I stuck to that. <laughs> she didn't like it, she wanted to call me Mary. The clearest of distinctions was drawn between employee and employer. Jane Phillipson grew up with a cook general and a housemaid. One didn't really communicate. I'm afraid one did, just it was a way of life you'd been brought up to, you didn't give it another thought. Maintaining an idle wife and idle daughters was the mark of success for a middle-class man. For women brought up to just such a life of leisure, the day had its own unremitting routine. It would start in the morning at about quarter past seven and the maid would come into the bedroom with an early morning tea tray and brown bread and butter because people were convinced they'd die of starvation before breakfast. Gong would sound and you'd go down to breakfast. And rather like a film, there would be these marvellous chafing dishes full of kedgeri and kidneys. The gong would sound again and we'd all sit down to probably only five courses at lunch. And then we'd come home to the most wonderful tea laid out in the drawing room with everything. I've tried to remember, I think it's about nine or ten courses for dinner. Then my job was to collect all the wine glasses and the sandwich plates and wash them, dry them, put them away, see the fires were safe and lock up. And I was 13. The First World War put an end to the Edwardian order of the middle-class home. Servants who went to work in factories during the war learned that working hours and conditions could be regulated. They left domestic service in droves. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I can give you no hope. Girls just won't look at domestic service these days. Many women had no choice. They had to learn to cope without servants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
my mother looked at them and said, darling, are you sure you boil socks? I said, no, you've got to boil everything. You know, everything has to be boiled to get it clean. He's been playing golf. He's been shooting there filthy. And so we put these beautiful hand-knitted socks that his mother had knitted into this saucepan and boiled them. <laughs> when we took them off, we gave them ten minutes like an overdone egg, you know. When we took them out, these awful little things appeared. It really was ghastly. They'd felted. And, and, of course, his mother had knitted them, and it was a terrible crisis. But help was at hand for the desperate middle-class homekeeper. Modern consumerism filled the gap with technology. The housewife was born. And now we can buy such a lot of lovely things. Uh -huh. A refrigerator and a new carpet. A vacuum cleaner, a huge armchair, and curtains and chintzes and lots and lots of clothes. And I know what you want. What? Yeah. Why, silly? A lovely new mower for the lawn. I think in the 1930s, housewifery became more aspirational. So for women whose husbands were in secure jobs and well-paid jobs, they did have the freedom to enjoy the pleasures of domesticity because they could afford to live in well-equipped houses, they could afford the labour-saving labor devices, and so the home stopped being a place of drudgery and back-breaking physical labour and instead became a place in which women could express themselves and could enjoy being in charge, could cook for their family, could decorate their homes, uh, could listen to the wireless. And this was a pleasure which increasing numbers of housewives would then experience in the 1950s. Of course, as technology progresses, this time, in a sense, maybe becomes too much time because this is in an era when most women are still not in the workplace, when a lot of professions still have a marriage bar in place. And then this is when you start to see the development of very real conditions like housewives neuroses, when what do you do to fill those hours when you've done everything that you need to do by 11 o'clock in the morning and you're still at home until someone comes home at five o'clock in the evening. It was to be the Second World War that opened many women's eyes to a different world of work. This time the servants left for good, seduced by the free evenings and better money. For the first time in history, more women were employed in offices than in the home. The war also meant that women were able to do traditionally male jobs. As the women's movement develops, it tries to learn lessons from the past and it's looking for historical precedents and looking for answers to questions that perhaps they're recognising are, are not such new questions after all. By the late 1980s, the women's movement was questioning gender stereotyping in all its forms. In the 1989 documentary Voices from the Doll's House, women looked back at how the Second World War changed their lives. When war broke out, I was directed into the shipbuilding industry and to Dundee's own Caledon shipyard as a welder. And there it was, to me, was wonderful. Out of this rough, raw place, this place full of rough, raw men rust, they built a thing of beauty, a ship, a wonderful thing. And then when it was launched, it floated, it really floated, it sailed. And the inside, all done up with oak panelling, the skill, the knowledge, uh, to me, was I saw everything as beautiful. allowed into the shipyard, provided they all went out again at the end of the war. The men were paid, I uh, uh, wouldn't like to be absolutely certain about it, but that time about £7 a week 
and my wages was two pound twelve and six. I was doing exactly the same as the men. Perhaps not every job, but we were putting off as much work as the men. We didn't even get to the end of the war. There were about 12 women welders in the yard at that time. And we were sent for one morning and the personnel officer sat there at his desk. He lifted his head and he said one word, redundant. I think the women of the 1980s are quite aware that their mother's freedom was lost after World War II. If you think we've had a hundred years of campaigning of female empowerment where the suffragettes have got the vote, we've also had huge amounts of legislation regarding married women and regarding women's access to the world of work. And yet the 50s are really constrained. Women have to be housewives. So the eight, women of the 80s, I think the daughters of those women, recognise this and are reaching for a legacy, a birthright that was previously denied. But many of the women whose lives were transformed by work in World War II didn't just forget about it. The desire to work outside the home rumbled on, largely unnoticed, through the 1950s. It wouldn't be until the 1960s that other factors sparked a dramatic change in women's lives and opinions. The 1966 programme, Six Sides of a Square, showed an unusually sympathetic view of one woman creating a new life for herself. The film highlights an emerging trend that seemed to be altering the structure of society itself. You've just gone back to work. Why did you do that? Because I was fed up and bored with staying at home. I mean, I had uh, two of the boys at school, and there was only me and the baby, and nothing to do. Jeannie Reed has three children, 11, 7 and 3. She didn't go out to work when they were very young, but she's now back at work in a shop, and she's glad of the extra money it gives her of her own. Oh, yes, I'm very independent now. You don't have to ask your husband. No, well, not that I did before, mind you, but now I can just go out and get what I want. If wives do work, family relationships must alter. A woman who's a full-time shop manageress can't also be a full-time cook, waitress and skivvy. The husband must accept that if his wife's work extends out of the home, his has to extend into it. Although the family has to pitch in, there is more money coming in. Mother has more to do but feels freer and happier. Oh, I think if you go to work, it gives you a, an interest in life, apart from just normal housework, looking after the children, cooking. I mean, when you go to work, you've got something to dress up for. Because being at work, you can't just go to work anyhow, like, you, you know, stay at home, wear trousers and an old jumper. But when you go out to work, you can wear a decent dress or something. On her way to the shop, Jeannie leaves her youngest child, Nigel, with his grandmother. But I'm manager of um, a carnival novelty shop. It's very nice. I find it very interesting. You meet different class of people. You know, you get different customers come in and you have a laugh. You know, it's not like going to work. May I help you, sir? Um. Yes, I wanted some practical jokes for a children's party. There's the mustard pot. <laughs> we got to Jeannie's hours in the somewhere. joke shop are normal shop hours, 9 till 5.30. Oh. And it's really only possible for her to do the job because her mother lives very close by and can look after the children. Many married women suffer agonies of frustration, wanting to work but having neither relatives nor other help to look after the children. Jeannie is lucky. She's not finished raising her family, but she already feels able to embark on a wholly new phase of life, another 20 or 30 years of partial independence at work. And uh, that's one and eight, two and two. Women now are not only financially independent in some degree, but are also able to do things long thought to be the prerogative of men. To many men, there's nothing quite so masculine as the view from behind a steering wheel. But questions of what is masculine or feminine are less clear-cut, and this affects marriage. Man's work and women's work have to be bargained afresh by each partner in each marriage. In the past, roles were clearer. 
I would tell you that women being independent is not unusual. We can see it in the Victorian period. Working class women earn. We know that middle class women could also earn and were working and that to have that freedom that comes from being an independent woman was totally acceptable. But post World War II, our society becomes incredibly conservative and women really are forced into this view of being housewives and nothing else. So Jeannie does become unusual because she's holding on to a freedom that women have had from an earlier time. In many respects, the pattern that was established in the 1960s of women working up to the birth of their first child, then taking a break and then coming back to work reflects the pattern of women's lives today. I think the main difference is that women now tend to go back to work in between having children rather than taking five, 10 or 15 years off in one single block. And they can do that because since 1975, pregnant women have a right to return uh, to their jobs and also to have maternity pay. That wasn't available in the 1960s. For Mrs. Reed's mother, Mrs. Beecroft, there were 40 years of bearing and rearing children, and now her numerous grandchildren. For Mrs. Reed, three is enough. I, I wouldn't have any more children. I determined not to have any more, so I went to the doctors and they gave me the birth pills. You know, they, you know the pills stop you having children. Well, I've been taking them for three years now, and I wouldn't stop taking them. I think they're marvellous. <laughs> The impact the pill would have on society would be greater than Jeannie could have known. But it takes time to see change. In this 1993 Time Watch, women look back on 30 years of the pill as a prescription for revolution. I left school when I was 17 and uh, by the time I was 18 I was pregnant and I got married in that order. and. Um, by the time I was 25, I had four children. Um, and so my life really stopped, in a way, because um, I'd taken up nursing training when I left school. I went straight into the nurse's home and I had to stop all that. <laughs> when I got pregnant so easily, um, and then so often so easily, despite the barrier methods, I thought my life is going to be as my grandmother's life was. She died at the age of 40, having had eight children. And I, I could see my life following hers and, and being like that. Hello. Is this one of those Yes. You've never been to us before. No, I haven't. Would you tell me what your name is? Mrs. Bishop. Mrs. Bishop, I want you to go upstairs to the first floor and they'll take down your particulars and you bring them down to me and you're going to start. Doctor, your turn. Yes, I promise you that you will be frightened. Thank you very much. Everybody looks a little frightened the first time. For married women, there weren't many options. Most GPs wouldn't advise on contraception, and that left the family planning clinics. When I started in the family planning work, in, um, advising on contraception, that was in 1958, we had the cap and that, oh, and the sheath for the male, and uh, people came to the clinics and knew what they were going to get. It was a cap or nothing and they were even then reluctant to come. It's dreary, you're sitting around with your knickers in your pocket with dozens of other women and you know they have their knickers in their pockets. And it's, it's really, it's terrible. I thought it was quite terrible, the whole attitude, the whole place. The choice of contraceptives wasn't great, but in the early 1960s, the alternative was worse the physical and emotional cost of backstreet abortions. Well, what have we here? Yeah, well, it's about that Oh, course. I know why you've come. There's only one reason why good-looking girls come to see Winnie. How far have you gone now? About three months. Oh, then you've only got a small problem in there, you? Well, it was quite a long time ago that I came here. About 25 years, I suppose. <laughs> it's all changed. It's different. walked along a road exactly like this. I didn't have the, the name 
of the woman because it was a secret, really. It was against the law and I just had the name. I just had the name of the road and the number. And I had my boyfriend with me. We were both quite nervous. Um, I just knocked on the door and went in and that was it. But uh, it's very strange coming back. It's, I didn't expect it to <laughs> affect me quite like it has. I was frightened, but I was so overcome with panic about being pregnant that I would have done anything to get rid of the baby that I didn't want. It was the most horrible feeling of being trapped. The lady who actually we were meant to see was an ex-nurse and she was living in the house with her mother. Um, as far as I was concerned, she was a saint, you know, I was so desperate. <laughs> and um, we went in and sat down and she was very... Um, made sure to tell me that I didn't tell anybody her name or anything like that, you know, it was all very hush-hush. And afterwards, when we came out, <laughs> just got the bus back to his place. Kathleen was just 19 years old. In those pre-pill days, she was one of at least 100,000 British women who endured backstreet abortions each year. Abortion becomes a critical issue in the 1960s, almost in the way that the vote was an issue in the, in the 1910s. And indeed, some of the suffragettes who survived and were asked about their experiences and parallels made this point that abortion was the thing that they saw that was the, the unifying thing. I think because abortion, like the vote, is very much an issue that affects women because they're women. So just as in the 1910s, no woman had a parliamentary vote, in the 1960s, no woman could get a legal abortion. If you were middle class or upper class, you could probably afford to pay for a safer backstreet abortion, but it was still a backstreet abortion. It was still an illegal act and it still carried all the risks that backstreet abortions carry. So I think it's because it's a universalizing experience that it was something that all women could rally behind. The debate on abortion has continued to this day, often dividing opinion and women. The same applies for the pill. When the pill was first developed in 1954, its inventors didn't envisage it being used by Western women. But it turned out to be those women whose lives would be radically changed. Two Americans, Dr. Gregory Pincus and Dr. John Rock, were testing the first oral contraceptive pill. To begin with, the pill was tried on small numbers of both men and women, with equal success but the trials on men were quickly abandoned when one of them developed shrunken testicles. The work on women continued, but the doctors couldn't get permission for a large-scale test of the new drug in America. So in 1956, the first mass trial on women alone took place in Puerto Rico. The results were spectacular. The pill provided almost 100% contraception. Dr. Pincus and Dr. Rock believed that they'd found the solution to one of the world's most pressing problems. They were hoping to put a break on world population because everyone was then very aware of the population explosion that was going on. And so they hoped that, particularly in the undeveloped countries, this would be controlling the population. In fact, it was largely taken up by the Western world, by the women of the Western world, and it succeeded in liberating their them and their sexuality, which is an effect, a bombshell, which Pincus and Rock had no idea they were letting loose. News of the American success traveled fast. A daily dose of estrogen and progesterone would stop a woman from ovulating. It seemed a space-age answer to an age-old problem. 
fitted in really well with the era. I mean, we had moon landings, we had mini skirts, everything was an atmosphere of freedom. So the pill really did fit in absolutely marvellously with that because the technology of it for a start, the pristine cleanliness of it, you just popped it out of the packet and popped it in your mouth. It was, And then you went out boogieing all night. You know, it was just, it was marvellous. It, it did give the impression of being totally an instrument of its age, if you like. Married women were discovering the freedom and control the pill could give them. Now single women wanted the benefits too. I did enjoy sex. I thought sex was quite wonderful. Um, and it allowed me to kind of indulge myself in that and explore that. The pill really enabled me to live my life as I wanted to. My mother regarded me as horrendously promiscuous and sinful. Were you promiscuous? If promiscuous, yes, I was. Yes, I was. Um, don't like the word because it's so pejorative, but yes. I did have sex with an awful lot of men. God bless them all, each and every one of them. <laughs> In 1967, after years of campaigning, abortion was finally made legal. It marked another turning point. A new generation of young women were beginning their sex lives on the pill. The pill wasn't revolutionary in the sense that women had been controlling their fertility and limiting their family using other methods before the 1960s. But it was revolutionary in the sense that it was a reliable form of contraception and it was a form which placed the control in women's hands, um, assuming that is that they could get mostly male GPs to prescribe it to them. Though all women who wanted to were now free to explore their sexuality, there were contradictory forces at work. Many of the images of women on popular television in the early 70s had little to do with sexual equality. Instead, they fueled male perceptions that women were now sexually available. So one of the, one of the things that the women's movement perhaps hadn't anticipated initially about the pill is that it has this knock-on effect where men immediately assume that all women will be sexually available and are constantly sexually available. One of the ways in which the women's movement reacts to this is by campaigning against all images that over-sexualise women, which goes just from, from page three, but also advertisements, advertisements for cars that try and make them look like women and, you know, the sort of um, se the sexist ads campaigns. The blurred line between sexual liberation and sexual exploitation became a goldmine for the advertising industry. Programmes like Time Watch give us the opportunity to notice inconsistencies that we just lived through at the time. In the 1960s, women may have been reclaiming their sexuality, but they were still finding little equality in marriage, as seen in this 1994 Women's History of Divorce, tellingly titled Presumed Guilty. Although we only hear one side of the story in this film, it reveals how women could feel trapped by the law. Most women were unaware of just how vulnerable they were, both legally and socially, until the reality of their marriage became apparent. I came home from work, I shut the front door, and the next time I opened it was to go back to work. I had no freedom of my own in any way, shape or form. I was his, I belonged to him, I moved where he wanted me to move, I did what he wanted me to do, I've bought the food that he wanted to eat. I um, had no personal freedom of any description. Clearly, this is a subjective account. But what happened next? Even in the supposedly liberated 60s, 
all the odds were stacked against a woman who wanted a divorce. I felt like a criminal in the dock. Um, I'd never been inside a, a courtroom in my life. But the way you were spoken to and the whole attitude of the court was that you were at fault. And there was certainly no suggestion that he'd done wrong. I think he should have been in the witness stand and had asked him what he'd done to me, he'd done to me, but it wasn't that way at all. Alice's children were two and four when, after a particularly violent beating, she decided that she could no longer live with her husband. As a result of her unhappiness, she had had an affair during her marriage. When she eventually came to be divorced, it was on the grounds of her adultery. Despite her violent marriage, Alice's affair left her and her children at the mercy of the law and her husband. I wanted to take the children with me, but he said um, I couldn't have the children. And uh, he would fight me in the court for them right to the bitter end. And, I, and so I said, well, he wasn't having them because he definitely wouldn't have been a fit father. His temper was such that he, he wouldn't have been fit to look after them. Even the, so, the social service lady said that unless I actually had a husband living, a man living with me, I couldn't have them anyway. But he, he had, was determined I wasn't having them and had it come to a court case, I wouldn't have got them because his father had a lot of money and I didn't. They could have made me out to be an unfit mother even though I wasn't because I'd had a, a man friend, you know, and you were an unfit mother in those cases, those circumstances. Although Alice's husband would not let her keep the children, he agreed that they could be adopted. Alice was convinced that this was their only chance of happiness. She found a childless woman who, with her husband, agreed to take them. I don't know. You can't describe to anybody what he feels like. You just know that you've got to do it. You steal yourself and that's it. I used to see children on the bus and used to feel terrible, but you just had to get on with it, you know. I mean, no. I didn't eat very much, lost a lot of weight. As I, as I say, I finished up in hospital emaciated. But I picked myself up and carried on. You just lived with it. You know, you just had to live with it. There was nothing else you could do. Alice never saw her children again. Finally, in 1969, with the promise of further legislation to protect women financially, the Divorce Reform Act, allowing divorce by consent and on the grounds of irretrievable breakdown, was passed. Although the concept of innocence and guilt in divorce had ended, the consequences of the old law remained with women for years. People said, oh, you were very brave to go and get divorced. But I didn't think it wasn't bravery, it was just being pushed to the absolute limit so you couldn't stand it any longer. But I don't regret it at all. And I think I got more confidence out of it in the long run. It's very uh, significant, I think, that after the 1969 Divorce Act, there was a huge surge in the number of divorces. And the vast majority of them were being uh, pushed forward by wives rather than husbands. But this connects in important ways to the whole co question of paid work for wives, because I think a lot of women who had been able to get back into the labour market once their children were older felt empowered then to seek divorces because they knew that they could, to some extent, earn their own living and look after themselves and their families. <laughs> While the media gave wide coverage to the effects of the pill on women's sexual liberation, it all but ignored the way the Divorce Act freed British women who'd been imprisoned in bad marriages. One of the things the 1969 Divorce Reform Act showed is that even though we'd had almost 150 years of feminist campaigning and legal rights being awarded to women, that marriage itself was still an incredibly closed institution and women had very few rights once inside it. It's really 
instrumental in pushing forward our final cultural reforms of showing that women deserve equal footing in all areas and need to be protected. And it's given us the modern feminist female orientated society that we have today that really focuses on women as being equal to men. This is International Women's Day today and you sent a male to interview me and a male cameraman. Where are the old women cameramen at the BBC? By 1978, feminism had won major victories, pushing through legislation on equality, sex discrimination and divorce. But if it's beginning to sound as though the women's movement had brought about equality by the 1970s, think again. In 1978, the BBC provided the public with a chance to make their own programmes. The series was called Open Door, and this episode is led by David State with his Campaign for the Feminine Woman. This programme is in praise of womanhood and femininity and will bring to your attention something that is happening in our society today which is more menacing and damaging to that society and to the happiness and natural fulfillment of men and women than either communism or fascism. I refer to the doctrine of those people who want to destroy the natural sex roles, who want to destroy the family, which is the basis of society, and therefore to destroy the happiness and fulfillment which these things provide. Men and women are equally important, but different. And these differences are the source of most human love and happiness, the most important things in life. But first, what are the sex differences which the equality-obsessed want to ignore? A doctor explains. Men and women are different in size, bone structure and appearance. A man is much more muscular and much stronger than a woman. He can carry about three times as much. The voice, skin and metabolism are different too. Women are less aggressive than men, and men usually have a stronger sex drive. Women are more ruled by their emotions than men. These attitudes are not unique. When the suffragettes were campaigning for the vote in the 1910s and they were imprisoned, the doctors in prison decided they were all hysteric, hysterics and diagnosed them as mad and insane. And the only reason why they would have these beliefs that they deserved equality with men was because their wombs were driving them mad. When we see that in the 1970s, we get very similar, if not exactly the same, physical arguments about the difference between men and women and why women aren't worthy of the same representation and legal rights as men. It's always fixated on the female body. It has been since time immemoria. Attacks on feminists have continued, now using the anonymity of the internet. Today, I think there's possibly greater articulation of anti-feminist feeling than we've had for decades and most of it comes through online. There seems to be something about the internet that makes people feel that they can say what they like with importunity. Um, this is why we've got very self-consciously campaigns like Reclaim the Internet which borrows the language of Reclaim the Night which were the, the sort of 1970s women's liberation movement marches to make the streets safer. I think that cyberspace is a very unsafe place to be a feminist. Part of the 1990s feminist reassessment of society looked at the roles of sexuality, class and race. The faces in these films have been virtually all white, but waves of post-war immigration from around the world have meant that non-white and mixed race women have had to overcome additional layers of discrimination. In this 1998 program, part of the Windrush series on immigrant communities, we see what it took for one mixed race woman, Pauline Burke, to change attitudes in 1970s Liverpool. And at the time, there was a stigma because you didn't see many black people in town, if any at all. I went for one interview. Uh, it was only a cleaning job. And the gentleman I spoke to at the time was very nice on the phone. 
But when I actually went to the interview, it was something different. His attitude seemed to change drastically. When he asked me, have I got any qualifications for doing a part-time cleaning job, I laughed. I went back to the job centre. At the time, there was job applications just coming in for the post office. I went for an interview first and they sort of asked me, what would you do in a situation where there was racial remarks? Also, what do I think of working with all males? Because at the time there was no women on the shop floor. They asked me about um, the language and I said, well, it's like you get bad language, no matter where. You will get stigma, no matter where. I said, but I will face that if I'm lucky enough to get the job anyway. From the interview, the letter came and I found out I had the job. When I went in, with not doing a walk or anything like that before, it was very strange. They put me on a walk, which a lot of the men complained because it was quite heavy. Um, but as I turned around and said, if this is the heaviest walk in the office, they can only get better. And basically I thought they were out to test me because I was a woman. But I sort of proved them all wrong because I sort of said to myself, well, I'm black and I'm a woman. And I'm going in with all guns, firing type of thing. Second wave feminism was dominated by mainly white middle class women and a lot of black women in Britain didn't feel that the women's liberation movement really spoke for them or really captured the issues and injustices that they faced as black women and the racial discrimination that they experienced. I think since the 1990s feminism has become much more inclusive and much more sensitised to those issues of race and much better at thinking about and talking about the diversity of women's experiences without losing that single focus on gender equality. By the new millennium, Sexism may have been less blatant than in the 1970s, but as the Money Programme reported in 2002, it could be just as insidious, no matter how powerful women became. This is how the programme reported one woman's claims. Louise Barton is well regarded as a media analyst in the city. She's worked in the square mile for 20 years. Recently, she topped a Reuters financial survey of city analysts. Her salary at Investec was well into six figures. She and her colleagues are only too aware of the discrepancies between men and women in the financial services. Are there circumstances where you've seen cases where you think if that woman were a man, she would be paid more or be treated differently? There's so many. I think yes, and I definitely yes. So yeah, yeah. A man promotes himself even when he's only doing his job. So a woman wouldn't do that because she believes, well, I'm doing my job. I'm paid to do this job. So why do I need to actually maintain this high profile? Women generally have to prove themselves above and beyond the level to which a man has to prove themselves. Louise thought she had proved herself over the years and would be safe from discrimination as a woman. Hello and uh, welcome to the talk show. It's all gone horribly wrong for ITV Digital, the pay TV platform. And it all went horribly wrong for Louise when she recruited high-flying media star Matthew Horsman. He joined her on the media analyst team, looking at a wide range of companies. They were initially both on the same salary. But then Matthew was given a £45,000 pay rise. Investec said it was because he had a high profile. I found out that um, Matthew Horseman had been paid considerably more than me um, since 1999. This was such a blatant demonstration of um, discrimination that I'd had enough. 
anyone in the city knows that revenue is very, very important um, in terms of uh, dictating what, what your worth is within a firm. And I believe that I, uh, that I produced a certain amount of revenue and then I should have been remunerated accordingly, and I wasn't. And that was just a red rag to a ball. Investec challenged her calculation. She decided to take the company to an employment tribunal. The panel deliberated for weeks. Finally, at the end of September, a judgment was due. Louise waited at home in Fulham. Nervous but hopeful. <laughs> That's about all I'll say. I think I'm waiting for the judgment. Um, it's been a long trip, hasn't it? Well, it has been a long trip. A lot of hard work and a lot of money um, and a lot of stress, really, as well. A few minutes later, the employment tribunal turned down her case. They decided she had not suffered sex discrimination. They could not rule on how bonuses should be calculated. It was a bad day for women because um, it will deter many women who have legitimate cases um, from doing anything because I've spent a fortune, I've had practically a year off work as a result of fighting a case. Many women will not take the risk. I mean, they will legitimately say this is not um, worth doing. The money program included a response from Investec, saying many different factors went towards a bonus decision and that the results showed that their decision-making process was fair. After the film was broadcast, Louise won the right to another tribunal, but she and Investec chose to reach a private settlement. After every moment of success, there is then an immediate backlash. So every time women have campaigned successfully to get themselves more rights and more freedom, we have a short period where everyone feels incredibly empowered and that's fantastic. And then the awful realization when society doesn't catch up. So you have fantastic success in the world of work and rights and yet endemic workplace sexism is still there. When the law discriminates against women and when the law ignores women, it's not that difficult to mobilise a campaign against that. You, you can see what you're up against. It's much more difficult to campaign against a culture because it can, it's amorphous. It can shift, it can change, it can manifest itself in different ways. And if it's not actually illegal, it's much more difficult to pin it down. I think future historians will look back on the early 21st century as a very mixed period for women. A period in which in some ways women seem to continue to forge ahead in terms of professional advance and political representation, but in other ways they face new pressures and new threats. Um, not least, I think, from some of the misogyny that the internet has unleashed in our culture. Over the last century, the lives of British women have changed in almost every aspect at an extraordinary rate. Those first wave feminists who fought for the vote as suffragettes wouldn't recognise the lives of women today, even if they might still recognise their frustration. As we've seen, the way history is portrayed is influenced by the fashions and constraints of the time. No doubt this process will continue as future generations of historians and filmmakers document women's experiences in Britain and reflect and reinterpret women's roles, 